This morning we'd like to have you turn with us to the seventh chapter of Luke. Let's begin with verse 36. One of the Pharisees desired Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he said to himself, This man... If he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, Well, I suppose that he to whom was forgiven most. And Jesus said unto him, You have rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears, and she's wiped them with the hairs of her head. You did not kiss me, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. And my head with oil you did not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And when they sat at meat with him, and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Here we see a contrast of two people on opposite ends of the social scale. One coming from the bottom of the social scale, the other coming from the upper echelons of the social scale. This man, Simon, a Pharisee, came from the upper echelons. And he desired that Jesus would eat with him. Now, an interesting thing about Jesus, he never turned down an invitation for dinner. (laughs) He loved eating with people. In fact, he would go so far as invite himself to eat with people. When he was in Jericho and Zacchaeus was up the tree in order to get a better view, he came right to the tree and said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm coming over to your house to eat. It is interesting that in the final messages of Jesus to his churches, he closes out the messages to the churches in Revelation chapter 3, 21. By saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and have supper with him. Lord just loves eating with people because he loves that close kind of intimacy that happens when people eat together. And so... Simon the Pharisee asked Jesus to come for dinner. Now, what his actual motive was, we really don't know. 
Is it possible that he had been listening to Jesus and had some questions in his mind? That he thought, well, maybe this could be the Messiah? Maybe if he comes to the house and we can sit down and have a warm chat together, uh, maybe I can discover the truth that he is indeed the Messiah. Or was he just looking for some excuse to find fault with Jesus? Was it sort of a trap? Was he going to try to ask lead questions or trick questions in order to catch Jesus and then to affirm his unbelief? I knew, look at that, you see, that proves. And, and he was just looking for something to bolster his unbelief in Jesus. Just what his real motives are, we are not told. But we are told that he was a rather ungracious host. You see, in those days, their shoes were open sandals. The roads were dusty. And when you would invite people to eat, as they entered the house, the first thing is that you would have a servant there with a basin of water to wash their feet. If you could not afford a servant, at least you had the water there to pour on their feet. Simon did not even provide that. Secondly, as the guest would enter the house, you would lay your hand upon his shoulder and you would give to him the kiss of peace, often kissing both cheeks. That was just common courtesy. Simon did not do that. And finally, you would put a drop of attar of rose perfume upon their head. That was to just lend a lovely fragrance to the atmosphere and the whole idea being that let's just have a beautiful time of sharing together. Simon did, do, did not do that. He did not do the basic common courtesies for Jesus when he came to dinner. And we find that he was soon finding fault with Jesus. In contrast to Simon, we have this woman who was a woman of the city, or you might say a street woman. She was a sinner. The Greek language indicates that this was the pattern of her life, that she was a prostitute, that she made her livelihood through prostitution, through sin. And when she heard that Jesus was at the house of Simon, she came. Now, usually the houses were built around a courtyard. And the feasting was usually in the courtyard. And, of course, you've got to sort of get out of your mind our Western culture where we have tables and chairs, a dinette set and all. None of that. They, they had the table was on the floor. And you would lie down with your left elbow. You would lean upon your left elbow, your feet behind you, and you'd lie at the table and you'd just pick off with your right hand, and you'd lie there and eat. So you would eat in a reclining position. That's why the woman could be standing at his feet behind him. So as Jesus was lying there, this woman came to the feast. Now, when you had a feast and a guest rabbi, the door was always left open for the public to come in. They would not eat of the feast, but they would stand around and listen to the words of wisdom that were given by the rabbi. 
And so when this woman heard that Jesus was invited to the house of Simon for the feast, she came to the feast. And standing at the feet of Jesus behind him, perhaps suddenly the Spirit of God began to reveal the truth to her about herself. She saw what a horrible sinner she was. Standing there by Jesus, just his very presence, purity, holiness. Perhaps it just did something in her heart, something that we have all felt at some time in our life when we became very conscious of our sin and broken by the Spirit. And she began to just weep sobbing over her sinful state. And as her tears began to fall, they dropped on the feet of Jesus. Perhaps with a little embarrassment, she knelt down and took her hair and began to wipe the tears off of his feet. And then she just began to kiss the feet of Jesus, continually kissing his feet. Now, the women usually had a little alabaster box of perfume that they carried with them sort of as a part of a necklace. And this woman took this little alabaster box of perfume and she poured it over the feet of Jesus. And Simon, the Pharisee, said within himself, If this man were a prophet, he would not allow this woman to touch him because she is a sinner. She's a prostitute. The Pharisees were very careful not to touch sinners. They felt that somehow sin could be transferred by just touching. And if they should accidentally bump into a sinner, they would go down to the spring of Gihon. They'd take off their clothes and they'd bathe themselves in a ritual bath in running water. They they wouldn't approach the temple grounds until they had gone through this ritual bathing because they happened to touch a sinner and they felt defiled because, you know, I touched you. In fact, when they would go down the street, they would wrap their robe very tight around them so that it wouldn't swish. They didn't want their swishing robe to maybe touch a sinner or to touch a woman or to touch a Gentile. For to them... It was equally bad, all three. And thus to keep themselves from defilement, that you would see them walking with their robes clutched tight around them so that they couldn't swing out and they would keep their distance from every woman and from every sinner and from every Gentile. And when he saw this prostitute, washing the feet of Jesus with her tears, drying them with her hair, and kissing them. Surely he cannot be a prophet when he allows sinners to touch him like that. Jesus said, Simon, I've got something to say to you. Simon said, Rabbi, say it. And Jesus said there was a man who had a couple of debtors. One owed him $50,000 and the other owed him $5,000. Now, neither man was able to pay his debt. And so he just wrote them both off, forgave them their debt. Which man do you suppose, loves him more? 
Simon said, well, I suppose the man that was forgiven the larger debt. Jesus said, you've judged rightly. And then Jesus began to call to his attention his discourtesy. Both of these men were debtors. Neither one could pay his debt. We realize that Jesus is drawing a spiritual parallel to the debt of sin that we all owe. For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there's a recognition that some have sinned more than others. Some of you are very moral people. Some of you have always tried to live by the golden rule. You've sought to be honest. You've sought to be a person of integrity. Still you have sinned, but not much. And then there are others who have broken almost every rule in the book. You've been a rank sinner. You've just really gone out and done the whole ten yards. There are degrees of sinners, but no matter where you might be, just sin a little or sin a lot, there's nothing that you can do to pay the debt to redeem yourself from your sinful state. Both were equally unable to pay, though one had a great debt and the other had a small debt. Neither could pay. Now, Jesus said, Simon... You did not provide water for my feet. You did not kiss me. You did not put perfume on my head. But this woman has washed my feet with tears. She dried them with her hair and she's been continually kissing my feet from the time I first reclined at the table. And she has anointed my feet with costly perfume. And thus I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Jesus acknowledged that this woman was a notable sinner. And Jesus said, for she loved much. For they that are forgiven much love much, but they that are forgiven little love little. Today, are you one who loves much or are you little love? Where do you stand? Shall we describe for you those that love little? First of all, they are usually in church unless it's sprinkling. And they sing, but not very loudly. You see, you don't want to get too enthusiastic. You won't find them at a prayer meeting, and seldom will you find them during the week in church. They take only enough spiritual nourishment to barely survive. They have family prayer sometimes, mainly at meals, and they can count on one hand all of the people that they've led to Jesus Christ. All of the things that they've done for the Lord can be recorded on a small little scratch pad. You see, sometimes it's harder for good people to receive the grace and goodness of God than it is for bad. Because they don't recognize their need and thus when they are forgiven they love little it's interesting to me how that 
there are certain people who have been forgiven so much, we don't even want to see God forgive them because they're so horrible. Their crimes are so horrible, but we don't want God to forgive them. I was very interested when Dahmer was murdered and when the papers reported the fact of, that he was murdered there in prison and that he had accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior while in prison, made a profession of faith, how many letters were written to the newspaper of people that were angry to think that he could be in heaven? I mean, that was just... They, they were upset that you could even suggest that such a man could be in heaven after all he did. The fellow who is accused of murdering Denise Huber has just in the last month or so here in Orange County Jail made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. You don't want to hear that, do you? It, it's interesting how the, there's just some people we don't want to see in heaven. Some people go so far as to say, well, if they're in heaven, I don't think I want to be there. Well, <laughs> consider the alternative. <laughs> Charles Tex Watson of the Manson family has made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I've had the opportunity to visit with Charles in prison. I correspond with him regularly. And he has a glowing witness for Jesus Christ. He has a tremendous love for the Lord. He's been forgiven much. And it is quite possible that his love far exceeds those who do not want to acknowledge that he's a Christian. Those that don't want to see him saved. Those who are forgiven much, love much. Those who are forgiven little, often love little. Now, don't jump to a false conclusion of thinking, well, I better go out and really do some horrible sins so I can be forgiven a lot so I can love more. Our love for the Lord is usually in ratio to our knowledge of the Lord. The more you know him, the more you love him. And that's why it's so important that you get to know him better. For to know him is to love him. And so Jesus said to this woman, your sins are forgiven. Don't you know that that must have sounded like music from heaven to her ears? To hear Jesus say to her, your sins are forgiven. Do you know what it is to have a heavy consciousness of guilt? As David wrote in the psalm that we read today, when he was guilty and was trying to cover and hide his guilt, he said that there was this roaring in my bones. They became weary because of the roaring. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and I became so dried up within that it was like the drought of summer. My moisture had turned into the drought of summer. Just that consciousness of my guilt, the consciousness of my wrongdoing. And this woman, knowing what kind of a woman she was, knowing the reputation that she had, standing there in the presence of Jesus, convicted of her sin, weeping over her condition, Tears falling on his feet. To hear him say, 
your sins are forgiven. Oh, how that must have just rang in her heart. You can hear those words today. Even as she heard them. The Bible says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, you can be as white as snow. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sin. And whether there's a little sin or whether there is a whole huge amount of sin in your life, you can't pay the debt. You can't atone for your own wrongdoings. Only Jesus can say, your sins are forgiven. And then Jesus added, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The war's over. You're no longer fighting against God. You're no longer rebelling against the word of God. The war's over. Go in peace. As you leave the house of worship today, will you be going in peace or will you go as you came with a heavy consciousness of guilt? The misery of the guilty conscience. You don't have to. You can go in peace today. And will you go with much love or with little love? On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate the love meter in your heart for the Lord? Is it slight or is it fervent? Something to think about. Shall we pray? Father, may we come to the feet of Jesus broken. Broken because of the consciousness of our guilt. And may we find his words spoken in love your sins are forgiven. And may we know that joy, that blessedness, and may we know the peace that comes through our sins being forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.